Uh, my name is Zach Shum, and I am the insect diagnostician or the arthropod diagnostician at USU or for USU Extension. So um, I've done a lot of my research as well, just going through graduate school and such on things related to biological control and managing insects with natural enemies. Uh, so it's a really interesting topic, and I, I'll preface this talk with I'm going to fly through some of these slides. Other slides I'll focus on. There's just way more slides here than I have time to present in 40 minutes. Um, but we can certainly uh, present the slides to you all as well, so you can read through some of the more in-depth ones. But um, I think often we we cover how to identify different natural enemies and biological control agents, but we don't really spend a lot of time discussing what biological control is as a general um, as a general practice. What's the theory behind it? Why does it work? Uh, how does biological control research happen, et cetera, et cetera? What are the different types of biological control? So. Uh, it's kind of an interesting and fun topic, so I figured I'd discuss that for this Twilight meeting. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat, too, as we're going through. That way you don't forget it by the end, but I will definitely take some questions at the end of the uh, talk as well. So if we think of any pest insect, uh, these pests can be managed in many different ways, and this often happens naturally. So things like weather, lack of resources like food and nesting sites, uh, those are both factors that are natural that help to keep pest populations down. But natural enemies are very abundant. We don't really pay a lot of mind to them, and they have a massive impact on the populations of other insects, many of which are indeed pests, at least for humans. And we, it's often, over, often overlooked. Um, we often say that every insect out there probably has at least one natural enemy. Some have many natural enemies. So natural enemies, biological control agents, they all have profound impacts on insect populations. So a natural enemy is essentially an insect or an organism in general that promotes their own population at the expense of their host or prey insect or a host or prey species. And as I mentioned, virtually all insects have at least one natural enemy. You can think of birds, for example, that tend to be generalist predators if they are insectivores. It doesn't really matter to them what insect they eat. They're going to consume a bunch of different insects. Uh, insect natural enemies are also very abundant. If we think of parasitoid wasps, for example, there are hundreds of thousands of species of wasps out there, most of which tend to be parasites and natural enemies of some insect that's out there. Uh, so very, very abundant, very, very common, but we don't really see a lot of them. So these are hopefully going to keep uh, that pest from reaching a pest status. So the goal of a natural enemy is to regulate the population of that pest species and keep it low, or at least low enough that we're not experiencing damage to plants, uh, for our purposes at least, right? So biological control is a term that typically, uh, it, well, I guess I can't say typically, it does mean that you're manipulating a living organism to obtain a reduction in a pest or to reduce pest status of an insect. So it's really important to note that biological control is purposeful manipulation. Uh, if it's something that's happened naturally, happening naturally in the landscape, we would call that um, sort of just a natural enemy uh, and things of that nature. So biological control is purposeful manipulation. If you take a container of ladybugs and you release it in your greenhouse, that is biological control because you're purposefully manipulating the population of beneficial insects or natural enemies in that landscape. There's another term called natural control, which is just all of these control measures that's also adding in things like weather, food, et cetera, things that can't be manipulated. So the theory behind biological control is no different than basic ecology and population dynamics of living things. So environmental factors are going to regulate population density of all these living organisms. We don't have to touch too much in base on this uh, just because it kind of goes into way more depth than we need to for the twilight meeting. Um, but essentially, uh, the pest is the thing being regulated by that biological control agent or natural enemy. So the population of natural enemies is going to be dependent on the population of pest organisms and vice versa. If there's more natural enemies present, the number of pest insects or the things being regulated is going to be lower. If the pest population is higher, that's going to be, be more food and more resources for that natural enemy. Again, we don't have to worry about that too much. Um, but the goal of biological control is essentially to create a self-sustaining system where the populations of pests go up, then the populations of the natural enemies can go up. Once there's not enough food left over for those natural enemies, the populations of natural enemies will then drop down. 
and then the pest population can go back up and it kind of fluctuates back and forth. So I pose this question and we don't have to answer it in the twilight meeting from you guys, but natural enemies that are introduced are rarely meant to completely eliminate a pest completely. And if we think of a greenhouse setting or any outdoor setting where there's a pest insect on a plant, if we have a natural enemy that we put in the landscape or it's already present in the landscape, if all the pests completely disappear, then there's nothing there for the predator, the beneficial insect or the natural enemy to predate on, to parasitize, et cetera. And they're gonna leave the area or they're just going to die off. So natural enemies should never be meant to completely eliminate pest populations. That's not really the goal with biological control. And just to kind of give that a little example of that ebb and flow and the fluctuations of pest populations and natural enemies, um, don't worry about some of the other terminology on here. These are just things that I've uh, taught on before to different groups. Uh, but we have a natural enemy population in the dotted line, so we can see if we have a really high pest population. Uh, once we introduce that natural enemy, there's a ton of food available at first, so that natural enemy population is going to increase drastically very quickly, but then it's going to knock down that prey population or that pest population, and these two populations sort of more or less track each other over time, and what we're trying to do is keep those populations to a point uh, lower than what we call, and this is in like an agricultural standpoint, the economic injury level, where if the pest population is above this, oh, my cursor's gone, there it is. If the pest population is above this, the grower is losing money. Um, this is a commercial standpoint, certainly, but it still applies. So we want to keep that population down below a point that's economically injurious, where it's causing economic harm to our crops. So I wanted to touch base briefly on the different types of biological control programs. Uh, there's classical biological control, which tends to be the most common, uh, at least on like a national level, for uh, invasive pests at the very least, where we're actually taking a new species and introducing it to an area where that species has never existed, establishing a permanent population of them to control a pest. Again, that typically is for invasive species. Uh, so if we have a species arrive in North America, that's a vegetable pest or a fruit pest, whatever, and there's nothing here to help control it, we can go and re uh, release a biological control agent that's also native to another area to help manage that pest population. There's things like conservation biological control where we're just conserving the existing natural enemies that are already present in a landscape. Uh, there's augmentative biological control, which is essentially mass rearing and releasing natural enemies at specific times. Sometimes this is also called inundative biological control where if you know pests are mostly present from June to July, you can just release a ton of biological control agents or natural enemies at that specific time to sort of just try to overwhelm that pest. So these are the three main types of biological control programs. I'm going to really quickly go through the history of biocontrol. I want to make sure I'm not going over time, and I am known to do that. So um, essentially, this is not a new practice. Uh, biological control has been going on for a very long time, since the late 1800s. Uh, and in 1888 was the first highly successful biological control program, and that was the introduction of the Vidalia beetle to manage cottony cushion scale in California. Uh, and certainly that biological control program is much more widespread at this point. So I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. This is just for reference purposes. Essentially, cottony cushion scale arrived in California from Australia sometime in the before 1876. And it's a really bad citrus pest. So it was really detrimental to the citrus industry in California. Growers really, really needed help. So an entomologist from the USDA went to Australia to look for natural enemies that sort of co-evolved with this cottony cushion scale where it was from. And they tried to find those things that were eating it to see if we could bring it over to the US to release it and hopefully control the cottony cushion scale here in North America as well. So Charles Riley did that primarily. And then uh, this other scientist, Albert Quabley, I don't know how he pronounced his name. Um, they identified a couple of different natural enemies, primarily a parasite and then the Vidalia beetle, which ultimately ended up being uh, the insect that they used. So they brought back that Vidalia beetle. They reared it in a California lab. The Vidalia beetle is a type of ladybug or ladybird beetle. And they're just a predator of cottony cushion scale and other insects as well. So we can see the cottony cushion scale here. Um, this is just like a protective covering. We see one of them crawling here. We see a couple of them down here. Ladybugs love to eat these cottony cushion scales, especially the Vidalia beetle. 
So uh, this is a really old picture, really big throwback here. So they surrounded trees that had the uh, cottony cushion scale with these little tent structures or house structures. They released Vidalia beetle inside these tents and they found that the Vidalia beetle was controlling the cottony cushion scale. And then they said that let's distribute this throughout our agricultural sites. Uh, so with the help of growers and state agencies, they released this beetle and they found widespread control and economic suppression of the cottony cushion scale by 1889, which was shortly after they brought it over to the US. So this costs less than $2,000, which is less than $60,000 today, although with the recent inflation, who knows what that $60,000 figure is. And cottony, or Vidalia beetle is still helping to suppress cottony cushion scale to this day. So this was a you know fairly low amount of money that went into this biological control program, and now it's saving growers thousands and thousands and millions of dollars over time. So that's kind of the goal of biological control is to create a self-sustaining system. It's going to be a big upfront cost, but it's going to save a ton of money over time rather than going out into our fields and spraying with insecticides yearly, right? So that's kind of the, the overarching goal. Um, I want to go over a couple of mistakes. So you might think, you know, there could be some problems with going over to Australia or a foreign country and bringing over a natural enemy or an insect to control another one. And that's true. Um, there have been many mistakes, some with insects, some with some others. I'll just describe them very briefly here. Um, cane toad, some of us have probably heard of that one before. This was introduced into Australia to control a type of beetle called the cane beetle. The problem with toads is that they're generalist predators. Um, so they pretty much eat everything, not just the cane beetles. And they can be harmful to things that eat them. Let's say a predatory bird comes off and eats the cane toad they can produce deadly toxins that can then harm or kill that bird. So this isn't really a good successful story. This was a really bad idea when we go back and think about it. Uh, Harlequin ladybird beetle. Um, so similar to the Vidalia beetle, same family, just a different species of ladybird or ladybug. So this was introduced from Asia to help control aphids. Uh, instead, they tend to outcompete our native ladybird beetles. And we have seen drastic reductions in native ladybird populations or ladybird beetle populations, due in part to this harlequin ladybird. And that's not really that good. Um, so I just put in here too, that if you ever see a ladybug that's red or the typical standard ladybug that has the W, or if you're looking at it the other direction, M shape on it, that's probably the harlequin ladybird beetle. Um, and that's the most common one we see now because they've just outcompeted most of our native species. So another example of this may not have been the best idea, um, but certainly they do eat aphids quite heavily. And these are typically the ones that you can buy in stores as well. Uh, so if you ever buy ladybird beetles and release them, these are really easy to come by. Uh, this is kind of the most insane one that is, is commonly in the literature. So mongoose was introduced to Hawaii to control rats and sugarcane fields. This was in the 1800s. And it completely, I guess, slipped everybody's mind that the target rats are out at night, they're nocturnal, and the mongoose is out during the day, so it's diurnal. Um, this is a very bad idea, and the mongoose, being a predator, it goes around and starts eating all the native birds, and we all know how just endemic Hawaii birds are, which means that they live nowhere else in the world. So there have been a lot of failures in biological control programs, um, but the good news that has come out of all that is that the research has changed heavily. So years of research now go into these biological control agent introduction programs. But again, it's this huge upfront investment. I mean, absolutely massive. One of the projects I'll talk about in a little bit here that I was involved in, there have been tens of millions of dollars going to study uh, these biological control agents. But in the long term, that $10, billion, or $10 million, sorry, is not a ton of money if we're gonna save growers $50 million in the next 20 years, right? Um, so the goal of these biological control programs is to save money in the long term with a lot of research and a lot of investment up front. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the Beneficial Insects Introduction Research Unit. Uh, this is in Newark, Delaware, and I'm talking about it because I've worked there uh, back when I was an undergraduate at University of Delaware. And this lab, their whole task is to do foreign exploration uh, let's say we have an invasive insect. The one that I'm going to talk about is the brown marmorated stink bug, which you might be aware of. We have this non-native insect. We don't really have any natural enemies here to help control it. This lab's purpose is to go over to the areas of the world where that insect is from, find natural enemies and biological control agents, bring them back and test them to make sure that they're safe to release. 
Um, so as all federal buildings are pretty boring, but once you get inside, it's quite interesting. This is like a little quarantine area. So there's biosafety level two quarantine. We had to put on some suits. Uh, we had to essentially go through five doors in order to get back to the area that the insects are kept in that are not native to this area. And uh, the reason the light is red is because insects can't really see red light very well. So we can see and we can go in there and open up the chambers. But if an insect were to accidentally escape, it would almost appear pitch black in there to the insect. So that's just a little safety mechanism. Uh, but a pretty cool place. And I'll just walk you through sort of the project that I worked on uh, on the brown marmorated stink bug because it's quite interesting. So uh, the first step is for an exploration. We have to figure out what insect we're dealing with that needs to be managed. We need to go to where that insect is native to. We need to find potential natural enemies that we might be able to release in the US pending a bunch of research. We need to bring that back to the US. We need to figure out how to rear it, how to take care of it, how to essentially just mass rear it and release it. We have to make sure it's safe, uh, safe for release. We wanna make sure it only targets the target pest and not our native insects that are already here. Um, all of that is, is being done actively in this process. So this insect is also common in Utah now, or at least fairly common. So the brown marmorated stink bug is an invasive insect here in the United States and other countries and continents. Uh, so it's economically important as a crop pest. If you have vegetables planted or fruit crops as well, it's likely, especially if you're, if you're in the Northern Utah area, uh, Utah County, Salt Lake County, Davis, Weaver counties, uh, and certainly creeping further north. I just moved into a new house the other a uh, couple weeks ago, and I found two of them in my new house in Logan so far. So they're here, and they feed on pretty much every crop pest that we plant or crop that we plant here in Utah, uh, fruit or vegetable. This was first identified in Pennsylvania in the 90s, and unfortunately, our natural enemies that are already present here in North America are not very effective at managing this insect, which is why it's spread pretty much throughout the whole country. So what we need to do in this biological control process is to, we have to assess the risk of the pest. Is this insect going to be a bad crop pest? We have to go over to Asia where this insect is native. We have to find natural enemies. We have to bring them back to quarantine. We have to identify what these natural enemies are. We have to make sure that they are safe to release here. This host specificity testing, I'll, I'll bring up some pictures in a minute. Um, we test to make sure that it's going to be safe to release. Then we need to know how it behaves, what's its ecology, what's its biology. We need to know everything about this insect that we could possibly know. And then after that, we can release them pending it goes through a petition process. And I'll talk about that briefly. Um, so, you know, we know the brown marmorated stink bug feeds them all of our crop pests. Um, back in, in the 90s, when this insect was first identified here, we started to find damage in fruit orchards, um, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I'm going to kind of breeze through some of this just to save a little bit of time. But we know that it has potential to be a very serious pest. And now, you know, pushing, what are we, 20 something years later, we know that it feeds on pretty much every crop and causes millions of dollars of agricultural loss every year to home gardeners, to commercial growers, et cetera. <clears throat> so then we have to do that for an exploration. So we pick some sites. Well, I didn't, I wasn't involved in this. This was before I started working there. But we pick some sites or they pick some sites where this insect is known to, known to exist. And as I talked about earlier, because most insects have at least one natural enemy, if you spend a lot of time there or enough time there, you can hopefully find those natural enemies. So we explore those locations where we know this insect is native to for these natural enemies. Uh, these are just some pictures of those travels that some of my supervisors were able to do. So they connect with scientists and other growers and farmers in Asia in this particular case. And they help to find those natural enemies. They go in the orchards where we know these insects are present and they survey for them. And it's important to note too, that these the brown marmorated stink bug is not a major crop pest in Eastern Asia because those natural enemies are there actively controlling the populations. Um, those insects don't exist here. So that's why we get these huge explosions in populations and crop problems or crop damage. Then we bring them back. Uh, there's a big petition process. We need to make sure they're packaged correctly. Everything you could possibly think of. We're not just allowed to go over there and collect insects that are alive, especially, and bring them back to North America. Uh, it has to, we have to have permits and we have to go through all sorts of things for that. And then there is the quarantine screening. So uh, this is just our 
quarantine door, at least the first of five before you got back to where the insects were actually kept. So it was kind of cool. You have to walk in there, let the door behind you close, and you had a suit on for all of this. Um, kind of cool. You always had to know who was in or out of quarantine, uh, just so you don't accidentally walk in as someone's walking out and there's two doors open at once. It pretty well regulated. Uh, just some more photographs of the quarantine area. Um, so these are sort of the suits that we would put on. And you would go through, again, five doors, I believe, before you got to where the colonies are. Um, you did have a little bit of natural light, so there would be some pretty secure windows in quarantine as well, but those are also just for safety purposes. We had like a big pickaxe back there that if there was a fire, we could still escape if we needed to, um, but very, very challenging to, <laughs> to get out once you're in there if, uh, unless you go through the windows in an emergency situation. So pretty cool, um, really interesting room. Make sure I'm keeping on track of time here. So uh, this, we just collected uh, different species of wasps that were parasitizing or natural enemies of the stink bug in Asia. We brought those 14 different colonies over from 14 different locations. And then we did some host specificity testing. Uh, so we essentially, um, we collect, so the I should note, that these wasps are only parasites or only parasitoids of stink bugs. So we know that there's not gonna be a problem with these insects parasitizing butterflies, for example. We knew enough already that they're only gonna be parasites of stink bugs. So we want to make sure that these wasps, if they were to be released at some point, are not going to harm our native and beneficial species of stink bugs. Um, so there's, um, there's ways that we can prioritize these things. Um, and public perception is actually included in that. Usually these petition things are, in, they involve a public comment period. I'll touch briefly on that in a little bit. But essentially we have beneficial species of stink bugs. Some are predatory, like the spine soldier bug here on the top in the middle. Um, Styretris ancarago, or the anchor, anchor stink bug. Really beautiful insect, is a really good predator of butterfly larvae as well. Brachymena. Uh, they're called rough stink bugs. They are found all over Utah and they're beneficial as well. So we're really concerned or we want to make sure that if we release this organism, it's not going to harm these beneficial species. We do have other pest species of stink bugs that can occasionally become economic. Well, they're typically not economic pests, but they can feed on crops unless they are a minor pest. So we're a little bit less concerned or we would be a little bit less concerned if the natural enemy that we decide to release is going to impact these other ones that we consider pests to some extent. Uh, and again, the goal isn't to cause the eradication or extinction of anything. So we wouldn't have to worry about these going extinct or anything, but we'd be a little bit less concerned typically if that natural enemy is going to impact something else that is a minor pest in North America. So what we did, um, don't worry about a lot of these, these words on here, um, we did some no choice tests and choice tests. And the no choice test is essentially rearing that stink bug that's native, getting, getting its eggs and seeing if that wasp, if we provide it these eggs of the native species, if it's going to parasitize those eggs. So I'll mention too that these wasps here are egg parasitoids. So they lay their eggs inside the stink bug egg. And that's really important to note here. So we give it this native species of egg here, and we see, is it going to parasitize those eggs? Um, we would follow that up with a brown marmorated stink bug egg mass, just to make sure that that wasp had the ability to lay eggs, and it wasn't just not stinging these because it had some uh, deformity or defect or something was wrong with it. So uh, we'd like to see it not sting the native egg mass or the native species egg mass, and we'd like to see that one followed up by it actually stinging and parasitizing a brown marmorated stink bug egg mass. We ran a bunch of those tests and then we uh, gave them a choice test where we literally provide them a native species egg mass and the brown marmorated stink bug egg mass to see if given the choice, is it going to select the invasive brown marmorated stink bug egg over the native species egg? Um, I could probably go into more detail on this and do a whole you know, week long course on this. Um, so we're just kind of breezing through, but it's important to note that we ran these tests for well over 10 years. Um, so you know, we uh, millions of dollars goes into research like this uh, throughout the country, not just in the lab that I worked in. And we run these rigorous tests because historically there have been some issues with some of the things we've released 
And we can't do that anymore. Um, we shouldn't have been able to do it back then, but research has certainly developed and changed over uh, human history. So let's say we run those tests. We also need to figure out the ecology of this insect. How does it behave? How is it gonna compete with our native species of parasitoid wasps? I guess I can point out too that there are native species in the same genus as this one, so very closely related, that are already present throughout North America. How are they gonna compete with them? Uh, basically everything. How does it overwinter? What does it feed on? Um, how long do they live? How many eggs can they lay? We try to figure out all of those things. And then we can release it, but I'll just point out to save time that it has to go through a very long petition process. So we have to petition to release it. They could send us back to the lab to run more testing until they get the data they want. They can grant that permit to release. And then we have to focus on mass rearing and releasing that insect in specific locations. Um, I'm not gonna go through all this, but there's like things like public comment periods. It involves a bunch of different acts like the Endangered Species Act, National Environmental Policy Act, uh, it includes a bunch of different things. Again, I'm just going to breeze through this. You just basically the, the point is that there's a lot of research and regulation that goes into releasing these organisms. Um, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service is involved in there, and they ultimately grant the final permit to release the insect. So, in summation, I guess the point here is that this process is very long and extensive, but you can trust it. Um, we put a lot of work and money and time into investigating these biological control agents. Um, it's a wor worldwide collaboration, and again, it's a huge upfront cost, and tax dollars often pay for this primarily, but there's a huge savings for the public and for taxpayers in the long term if um, and when these projects work or are successful, and they typically are. Okay, now for just some, uh, some information on the different types of biological control agents, I'll talk about... Um, the different groups of insects that are biological control agents help you identify them in the landscape and just kind of go over some more detail on them because they're much more diverse, I think, than we tend to think. So the, the different types of biological control agents are predators, things that are eating things and consuming organisms, uh, parasites, as you would expect or would expect. This is any sort of animal or organism that lives on or within a host and feeds on the host. And parasitoids specifically, and I used that word before, oops, uh, is an insect that is parasitizing another insect. So in the entomology world and most of the uh, biological control that's happening in our gardens, they tend to be parasitoids. Um, you can use parasite interchangeably and no one's gonna like bat an eye at you, but technically the correct term is parasitoids. Uh, so predators, uh, these ones are often not used for biological control programs. Uh, these are have less host specificity, so that's we would call a generalist, and we this is what the cane toad is and the mongoose. They don't really care what they're eating as long as they are big enough to consume something. They're probably going to do it. So we don't typically focus on these because there could be worse impacts to native species or other beneficial organisms in the landscape. So very, very rarely are these used for biological control programs, um, but certainly they do eat pests and lots of other things as well. Oh, and I kind of already mentioned this, but you know they're not discriminating between prey life stage. Uh, they don't really care what prey it is as long as they can eat it most of the time. Um, curiously, and this is just a little side fun note, uh, with predators really, um, and you'll notice a difference with parasites and parasitoids or parasitoids at the very least, more than one prey item is going to be needed to for that insect to develop from its immature stage to its adult stage. Very rarely, I'm sure there's an example of it somewhere, can an insect eat one insect and make it all the way from its, I just hatched out of my egg stage to I'm an adult. It'll have to keep consuming prey over its lifetime, which sounds like a good thing, but in the long run, parasitoids are still much more effective. I know you don't know what a lot of these words are, most likely, um, some of you probably do. That's great. Um, these are just the order names for different types of insects. So we have beetles here, uh, net-winged insects, bees and wasps, hymenoptera, diptera are the flies, hemiptera are the true bugs like assassin bugs, um, stink bugs even, and things of that nature. So there's lots of predators out there. They're very abundant. Many, many insects predate on other insects. <clears throat> so parasites, as I mentioned, are any animal that lives on or in a host. Um, and because the parasitoids is much more specific for the insect literature, 
there aren't really many insects that are just true parasites of other insects, but there's many para insect parasites of other fauna or organisms. Uh, lice and fleas here on the left and in the center are, we know are paras parasites of mammals. Um, nematodes, which are not insects, are parasites of insects, however, um, but not many insects are parasites of other insects. Parasitoids, however, are very, very interesting, very um, abundant, very effective at managing the pest populations, and their biology is a lot different than those predators. So we have an adult that is free living in the landscape. It's flying around, it's walking around, and things of that nature. But in its immature stage, uh, they are parasitic, right? Um, so again, you can kind of use these words interchangeably. So a parasitoid technically is parasitic, but it Specifically, you wouldn't consider it a parasite. Anyway, um, so that immature stage uh, is parasitic on that host. This always results in the death of the host. Some predators, for example, you can eat like two of the legs of a prey item and that prey item is still going to live. For parasitoids, it always ends in the death of the host. Uh, most species of these are going to attack the immature life stages of other insects. So like the stink bug example, it was an egg parasitoid. So it laid its eggs inside the egg of the stink bug and killed that developing nymph. Um, the, and the good thing about parasitoids is they often are much more host specific. Some of them only parasitize a single family of organisms. Others parasitize only a single genus. Some parasitoids are only parasitoids of a single species of organism. So they're much more host specific. And that's a good thing because we don't want our natural enemies to manage other things besides what we want them to manage. And these are without a doubt, the most common agents for biological control programs. Oops, there we go. Okay, running out of time here. So I'm gonna kind of breeze through the orders of insects that have known parasitoids in them. Strepsiptera are really interesting ones that are parasitoids of paper wasps. Very, very hard to find. I've never actually found one in nature. Um, I've seen them in collections. Someone's given me one, but I've never found one. Um, again, this is just because I was using this part of this slides to teach one of the courses at USU. Um, anyway, really cool parasites, but you're probably, most people will live their entire life and never see one, but they're out there. Uh, Neuroptera, like the, um, sort of like the green lacewing that you're probably all familiar with to some extent. There is a group of those that are parasites, but only on freshwater sponges. So we don't have to worry about those for insects. Uh, Coleoptera, so some beetles are parasitoids, believe it or not. Uh, this wedge-shaped beetle, for example, are parasitic or parasites or parasitoids of bees and wasps. Uh, they have really cool antenna. I've never seen one of these in Utah, so you might not find one, but they tend to sit on like wildflowers that wasps will visit. Um, if you ever see really crazy antenna like this and it looks sort of like a beetle, it could be one of these, but I've never seen one in Utah. Super cool though. Um, there are parasitoid or parasitic, I'm going to use the word interchangeably again, butterflies. Um, really, really interesting. These little, uh, uh, they're lysenids or hair streak butterflies. They are brood parasites of Myrmica ants, so a, just a genus of ants. So these, um, when, they're, when they first hatch, they're going to feed on seeds of plants, uh, but then ants will take them and the larvae will, and I guess the ants take them to try to eat them or feed them to the nest or something like that. Then the larvae will start to steal their nest resources and they'll eventually pupate. Really, really cool. So this isn't just wasps out there doing this. Um, there's many different types of insects. Flies are really common parasitoids, uh, many different species. I'll bring up one in a couple of minutes here. And then bees and wasps in the order Hymenoptera are without a doubt the most common parasitoids out there. Um, there's a ton of different diversity. We have these little tiny ones that are about the size of an aphid. We have these absolutely massive giant ichneumonid wasps that are parasites or parasitoids of wood boring insects, uh, like wood boring beetles, for example. Um, so if you ever see a wasp in your garden that doesn't look like a paper wasp, odds are it's something highly beneficial to the landscape. And not, over 99% of wasps do not have the ability to sting. Um, if you ever see a caterpillar with a bunch of these white fuzzy structures on them, those are wasp pupae. Um, or pupa, however you want to call them. Um, so again, wasps, very, very abundant, probably the most impactful and important parasitoids of other insects. So parasitoids function in a couple of different ways. Uh, 
Parasitoid eggs can be laid on body walls of insects, like we see in this photo here of this tachinid fly. Uh, this is one of the, we can find these on squash bugs quite readily in Utah and other regions as well. If you ever see a little white bump on a squash bug, it's most likely to be the egg of this tachinid fly here. So those eggs can be laid on the body wall of insects or the insect can lay the egg inside of the host. Sort of like the uh, parasitoid wasp that of the brown marmorated stink bug that lays its egg inside the egg of that stink bug. Um, so if the egg or if the insect egg is laid on the surface of the body, that larvae can then emerge and bore into the body of that insect and slowly eat it away, et cetera, et cetera. So parasitoids are generally more effective for many different reasons. Uh, their survival is usually higher. They're not exposed to the elements as much as predators are. Uh, they're protected inside an egg or inside of that insect. Um, so they survive more in that regard. Uh, really interestingly, only one part of that host is usually required for development. So they only need the egg or they only need one life stage of that insect to make it all the way from immature stage to adulthood. That's much different than the predators that need to feed throughout their entire life as they slowly grow. Um, so populations of parasitoids can be sustained at very low host numbers. You don't need a ton of hosts in there or prey items, for example, to keep the populations sustained. If you release a bunch of ladybugs to, in your greenhouse to control aphids, uh, a lot of those ladybugs are probably going to die because the food source isn't being sustained properly. Uh, essentially, they regulate themselves back and forth very, very well compared to predators. And really importantly, they are much more host specific, as I've already mentioned. Um, so there's less competition between species. Uh, and there's essentially, so they just, um, they respond really well to host density. So um, very, very effective. Um, I can, I already am predicting some of the questions that are going to pop up. So I'll try to address those. Oh, that's what I put at the end. That wasn't bad timing. Um, so I, I guess I'll bring up now. So one of the questions we frequently get, or at least I get at extension is, you know, what can I do to buy some natural enemies like a predator, like a ladybug or some mantises and release them in my landscape and my garden to help control insects? And I don't think I've ever recommended that outright um, because predators tend to leave the landscape very quickly because the prey numbers drop drastically quickly. There's nothing for the prey or the predators to eat. They're going to fly away very quickly. Uh, so I've never actually recommended that. And as you're probably aware, it's really hard to go buy parasitoids uh, to release in your garden as well. So I guess the, the main point of all that is to um, understand these differences between predators and parasitoids, understand that it's not usually recommended to just go buy ladybugs as your first method of controlling a pest. Uh, because most of the ladybugs are probably going to leave or they're going to die or something like that. If you're in a greenhouse setting or something, it can result in some temporary knockdown of prey populations, but it's not really sustainable. 